the title of the message that I'll be sharing today. Actually, the Lord laid this on my heart during a sleepless night. I believe it was Tuesday. Didn't know for what purpose or when I might be sharing it, but here I am. I only discovered the day following why. As I talked with my pastor, the title of the message is, Where is God? And I think that all of us can say, I know I can admit it about my own life, that many times in my life as as I was experiencing difficult and adverse circumstances, my heart cried out, where, where is God? God, where are you? And even David, a man uh, depicted as being after God's own heart, often cried out in times of, of adversity and, and questioned in his own heart where, where God is at. And uh, I can give many examples of my own where I can say that and I know that you can all search your minds at this moment and don't have to search very hard to think of times in your life when you question where where is God and where is he at in all of this that you're going through when we're facing adversity in life when you're battling perhaps sickness and disease many times you cry out where is God or God, where are you? When you're struggling financially, perhaps, or when you're going through uh, relationship battles or marital battles or uh, difficulties, uh, when your children who you've raised in the love and admonition of the Lord have grown, have grown up and gone wayward and walked away from the Lord, oftentimes perhaps in your mind and your heart cries out, God, where are you at? Uh, <clears throat> when you've lost a loved one dear, oftentimes, and I can certainly relate to this, especially when it's premature. I just recently lost a friend younger than myself who was so seemingly healthy and never had health issues in his life and, and very physically fit and spent a lot of time hiking in the mountains and, and uh, just enjoying life with uh, no, no signs of poor health of any kind as he was hiking. His last words to his daughter were, I don't feel good, and he dropped dead with a heart attack, leaving his loving wife and children that he still had at home and also children that have left home and have children of their own. He left young children and grandchildren behind and, and, and a young wife. And a lot of times, you know, it's times like that when we have to say to ourselves, we often ask ourselves the question, God, where are you at in all of this? There's so much we don't understand a lot of times about adversity in life and, and you know, how a, a great and awesome and all-powerful and loving God can just seemingly sometimes seemingly stand by and be oblivious to the things that are occurring in our lives around us. And, and uh, you know, there's just so many things. One of the things that's difficult for me, I just spoken of losing, losing a loved one dear. And I, I know, you know, I mean, uh, 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 how it is, whether they're young or old, it's a difficult thing to go through. We're never ready to leave go. But but, uh, you know, that's one of those things that uh, I'll be sharing later, perhaps, if, if time doesn't get away, that, that uh, I went th uh, through and had such a difficult uh, time of in my life and questioned God's, uh, uh, you know, uh, his presence and where he is at. And uh, one of the most difficult things for me is when children suffer. When I have to see children suffer, it just, you know, it just wrenches my heart. And, and I often say, God, where are you at in all of this? Where, where is God in all of this? And that's a, a difficult thing for me to experience, especially when children, young children are mistreated. I've, I've had children of my own and raised and loved them dear. And now I have grandchildren and, and discovered a love that, that, 
you know, a level of it that I just didn't even know was. And, you know, when I think of anyone not loving a youngster, and then even further yet, mistreating them or abusing them, you know, it's just stuff like that that's hard. It's stuff like that that makes Pete Carnahan say, God, where are you? Where, where are you at in all of this? It's difficult when tragedies occur in our society, like devastating natural disasters, or say things like senseless murders, like school shootings or terroristic events. It's times like that and things like that that cause us to cry out, God, where, where are you at? Where are you at in all of this? All of us has, have asked at one time or another during adverse times in our lives, everyone has at one time or another, if not many times, cried out, where is God in all of this? I enjoy David's analysis, even though he also at many times cried out, where is God at in all of this? He often felt those same things and thought those same thoughts that we experience in our own personal lives in his times of grief and adversity in life to where he cried out, God, where are you? Even at one point, uh, even at one point crying out the very words that Christ himself cried out on the cross, God, God why have thou forsaken me? But I enjoy David's analysis of where God really is in the world and where God really is in our lives in this world because even though uh, David himself cried out at times of adversity, where, where, God, where are you and where are you at and all of this, even though he experienced those things in his life the same as we ourselves experienced those things, David in his heart of hearts, deep down in his heart and always in the back of his mind and in the deepest recesses of his heart, he had a keen understanding of indeed where God is in the world and where God is in our lives in this world. However, I wonder, and I would like to help you today to understand and discover and believe with me, I wonder, do we really grasp, do we really grasp the concept of where God is in this world in which we live, and do we really grasp the concept of it during adverse times in our lives? The scripture that I am using for my text this morning is a very familiar one in the book of Psalms, chapter 139. And if you'll turn to it, please, and stand as I read and follow along as I read, uh, stand in reverence to God's word, and, and then I'll continue with uh, the message that hopefully I can bring forth quickly and... and, uh, and uh, cover everything thoroughly. In Psalms 139 is uh, just such a beautiful analysis by David of where God is in our lives in this world. Follow along as I read uh, beginning in verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising, and thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot 
I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, yea, The darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee, for thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being on perfect and in thy book all thy members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them how precious also are thy thoughts unto me O God how great is the sum of them if I should count them they are more in number than the sand kind heavenly father I thank you for your word, powerful and precious and true, and far be it for me to bring it any justice. I need your help, Lord. I can accomplish nothing without you, Lord. I can't illuminate the mind. I can't fascinate these people uh, uh, with any words of my own uh, in an everlasting way, Heavenly Father. We need to reach, uh, we need their word this morning to reach our hearts, not just theirs, but mine as well, dear Lord, as I bring it forth. I just pray for your anointing and for your help this morning, Heavenly Father, and I pray that you'll just pour out your revelating spirit upon us this morning, that your word might be rightly applied to every heart and so on this place, so that we might go forth from this place and demonstrate it powerfully in our lives, that we might be a witness and a testimony to the lost and dying souls around us in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So many times in our lives we ask the question, where is God at? I can think of a time in my life where I literally screamed and cried out, God, where are you? And perhaps if time allows, I'll I'll get to that. But uh, this is something that we can all relate to. We have all gone through such difficulties in our life that, that we have cried out at times, where is God in all of this? And even though David himself experienced these things that we experienced, I want to bring to light and I want to bring to our attention this morning that in spite of the reality that David also experienced these things, he had a keen awareness, he had a sharp understanding of where God really is at in this world that we live at in and in uh, these lives that we live in this world. Uh, Many times it's easy to feel as if he's not there and it's easy to feel as if even as as David put it in his own words that that, uh, God has forsaken us. But but, uh, I hope to bring to our attention this morning David's keen uh, awareness and understanding of where God really is at in this world in which we live. I have to try and uh, gather my thoughts from the recesses of my mind, which is a difficult thing for me because I have no written script. I, 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 I just have a basic and probably poorly prepared outline, but uh, I, I know the Lord knows the things that, that he would like for me to present to you this morning, and uh, he'll help me get them from my jumbled mind and translate them into spoken words. Uh, recently, uh, I've begun studying... I've begun, an, I've begun a ministerial study, and uh, one of the first things that I needed to do was uh, get myself a Strong's Concordance, and uh, perhaps some of you have used a Bible concordance. Uh, I never had, and uh, I needed to go and get one, and uh, uh, this is an irrelated point, but I quickly... Uh, uh, felt as if they could, should have called it the Strong's Confusion. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm getting along with it. I'm beginning to understand it and, and be able to use it. And it's been quite helpful to me. But uh, the reason I mentioned that is uh, 
I didn't have time to go to the Bible Depot where I was sure I could purchase one. So uh, as I was uh, at one point in time to save time, something that I have so little of, I thought I'd go to the bookstore in the mall and, and, and purchase a strong concordance there if perhaps they had one. And to my disappointment, they did not, but it was a beautiful accident because I found something there that has become very special to me and something that I wish I had had for quite a long time. I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, I thought I would get something at least uh, similar to a concordance to help me in my study. And uh, the closest thing I thought that would be helpful to me and the things that the ministerial study was presenting to me was a good study Bible. And I just happened to... uh, uh, pick up one that, uh, if for no other reason, which there are other reasons, but for no other reason, I think of Elroy from time to time. I think of him now every day as I pick up this Bible because uh, in place of a strong concordance that I couldn't find at the mall, I picked up a study Bible, the Jeremiah Jeremiah study Bible. Perhaps you have one, Elroy, uh, by Dr. David Jeremiah. And and I can't put the thing down. I just really can't. I mean, the man's insight into God's Word and his interpretation of it, it's something I always enjoyed in his television ministry, but it's in such depth and detail in his study Bible, and uh, I have enjoyed it so much. But anyhow, uh, as, as, as he analyzed uh, David's analysis of... Uh, where God is at in this world that we live in and in our lives in this world in which we live. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeremiah found it fascinating in this way. Uh, Brain fade. Uh, Dick, or... I too find it fascinating that, and we should all be fascinated by uh, God's awareness of humankind, God's awareness of humanity in the sense that uh, he perceives our very thoughts. That overwhelmed David. That God cares about every detail of a person's life. If you can imagine, and it's difficult to imagine, a lot of times it's difficult for us to remember when we're going through adverse times and wonder where God is at in all of this. It's difficult for us to remember, let alone understand, that God is... I had to write the definitions down. I never can remember them. Omnipotent. God is all-powerful. That's something that we can't relate to and understand. God is omnipresent. In other words, he possesses the ability to be everywhere at one time. And God is omniscient. He knows all things. He is infinitely wise. You know, we can't understand. We can't you know, at least my mind certainly can't process this, the God's omnipotent and omnipresence and omniscience. It's just hard for us to fathom. And David, he was fascinated by this and, uh, you know, that God could perceive our very thoughts. Uh, You have searched me, O Lord, David penned, and you know me. You know uh, when I sit and when I rise. You you perceive my very thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down, and you are familiar with all of my ways. A lot of times when uh, it seems like God's not there, let us be reminded that he knows our very thoughts. You know, a lot of times uh, we hold God accountable accountable for things that he's not necessarily accountable for. And one of the things that we often hold God accountable for that he's not a, uh, necessarily accountable for is that he act in some way 
in relation to the circumstances that we're going through. And what I mean by that is not that he doesn't care and not that he doesn't have a plan and not that he doesn't know our thoughts as David penned. But we, we, we hold God accountable for things as if he operates within the constraints of time. There's no time to him. Time certainly is, exists uh, for us, and, and it's difficult for us to go through time of adversity. And we often think that, God, where are you at? Why aren't you doing something about this? You need to do something about this. And we cry out to him, where are you at? As if he uh, exists within the constraints of time, but he does not. And... Uh, I can't tell you how much I'd like to have a written outline and feel like I'm doing a lousy job, but I'll get it done and hopefully it, it will be helpful to us all. Uh, you know, we, all, we, all, uh, we certainly do exist within the constraints of time, and time is something that, uh, well, humans, we're just not good with it. We're impatient. We want, we want what we want, and we want it now. And, you know, we're, we're like that a lot when we're going through adversity, you know. We, we want our, our answer immediately, and we want our help immediately. And, and we kind of, when we say, God, why, why aren't you helping me? Where are you at in all of this? We're kind of uh, holding God uh, or, or, or looking at God as with he, he uh, operates within the constraints of time, but he does not. One of the things we need to remember is, is patience when we're going through difficult and adverse things and know that God has not forsaken us. God has not abandoned us. God has, God does love and care for us. He knows our thoughts before we even think them. And, and how could we ever think? How could I ever think? And I've done it in my life and, and I apologize for it now. How could I ever think that God don't care about me because of the things that I'm going through and experiencing life as if, and he's uh, not acting. It's as if he's oblivious to us. So, so uh, I think uh, uh, as David penned these words that the Lord searched and knew, uh, and knew him, that we are to be reminded that God sees and knows everything that we are going through. And it's, uh, you know, not necessarily helpful or, or good uh, for us to ever question where, where are you at in all of this, God, even though we do it because we're human. Uh, you know, I... Uh, I like, I like to study nature, and this is a different message, and I can only touch on it because I actually have, have uh, prepared this message for the final Sunday in the month if perhaps the pastor keeps his vacation. But I like to study nature, not just nature itself, but I like to study the nature of things and most of all, the nature of people. And... I find it interesting how it's human nature for us to immediately question where God's at when we need him. A lot of times we don't even look for him when we don't. You know, that's a a human thing, you know, and that's always fascinated me about human nature, how we cry out for someone or something when we're in need, but a lot of times we're oblivious to that thing that we want so bad when we're in need, and I think a lot of times we treat God that way. Where are you at, God, the instant that we have a need? but how much are we seeking him and looking for him when we don't have that need? And I just always found that fascinating about human nature, and it, it causes me to think of that action of human nature. Whenever there's a tragedy in our society, whenever there's uh, things like terroristic events, uh, you know, and, and school shootings and things, immediately people are crying out to God and wondering where he's at in all of this. And how much do we 
wonder where God's at when things are going well and when things are beautiful in our lives. Just something I wanted to bring to our attention today. And it's always fascinated me how, and this is one of these things, I don't know if you call it a pet peeve or, or what you want to call it. And I may, even, I may even gently hurt somebody's feelings here this morning, but it has always uh, been an annoyance to me. Even though I question at times myself, and we all do, where's God at in all of this? It's always been annoying, annoying to me when people say things like, uh, you know, in one of the school shootings, uh, somebody questioned uh, whether it was on the internet or, a, or it was on the news or television or what. Somebody questioned where was God when, when this sh- shooting was occurring in our schools. And I remember somebody making the statement in, in rebuttal to that question something like this. Uh, we kicked God out of school. And You know, as much as this might offend somebody, I got to tell you, you got to hear this. You got to understand this. You got to grasp the reality of this. I understand the concept that God isn't reverenced in our schools like he used to be. I understand that concept because sadly I'm I'm getting up there, Gene. I'm not a youngster anymore. I remember when we read the Bible, first thing in school. And I remember right after that that we had prayer. And I remember after those two important things, then school happened. I remember that. And I understand the concept that God isn't reverenced in our schools like he should be. And he's not reverenced in our schools like he used to be. But come on, people, understand this with me. Who do we think we are that we can kick God out of anywhere? I'm here to tell you this morning, even though God's not reverenced in our schools like he used to be, don't tell me we kicked him out because he's in every school in this nation and he's in every place in this country. Who does mankind think that he is that we can manipulate or, or, or determine where he is or should be? He's everywhere. He is present everywhere that you go. God is not forsaken if any human being on this earth and sadly some will at some day some day some will if any human being on this earth ever experienced a place or a time in this world or in this life when where God did not where God was not where God certainly had forsaken them if you ever experienced only one only one person ever in this world Jesus Christ on the cross and he did it for the sake of my sin he suffered the full penalty for my sin and one of the greatest penalties that he suffered for my sin and for the sin of all mankind is he was the only person yes he was God but he was human he was he was uh, God in person he is the only person ever to experience God's forsaking when he cried out on the cross unlike David who cried before him and unlike all of us that cry out sometimes God why have you forsaken me and where are you at Christ alone is the only one the only person to ever walk the face of this earth that really experienced the forsaking of God, and I can tell you it was one of the greatest penalties he paid for my sin and the sin of all mankind. And it always rubbed me a little bit the wrong way. I understand the concept that we don't un- uh, reverence God in, in our public institutions like we used to and indeed in our schools as well. But do you understand this? We don't have the ability to dictate where God is and where he goes. We didn't kick him out of school. We just chose not to reverence him like we used to. And I'll tell you something more. He's there. He's in the hearts of 
about men and women in our public schools today. Yeah, they may be suppressed and not able to reverence him like they would like, but God is there. We can't kick him out of any place. He's in the hearts of young children. I was certainly not a witness and a testimony to the lost and dying souls around me in the world as a youngster in school, but I can tell you this. God lived in my little heart, and although I didn't know exactly what to do with that. He was there and because he was there, he was in the school that I went to. Even when we, uh, as people like to say, kicked him out, we didn't kick him out of anywhere. He's in every place. His presence is everywhere. No human being on this earth yet to this time has ever experienced the forsaking of God, has ever experienced a time or place where uh, he was not present. And I can tell you, I hope none of you ever do make, make, make the uh, uh, Lord Savior of your life because that's not something you want to experience. I promise you at some point, God is going to turn his back on this world. I don't intend to be here. I don't think any of you will either. But it's not something you want to experience. And David really uh, meant to express as he penned this scripture that who do we think we are that we can dictate where God is or isn't? He created all of this. He is everywhere that we go. And, uh, you know, it's just one of the things that I wanted to bring to light is when we're going through those adverse times, when we're, we're going through those difficult times and we cry out, I do it too. I, I'm, not, I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm not even a preacher. I'm just imitating one. I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm talking to me too. I've cried out, God, where are you at in all of this? I've felt at times in my life that God, uh, you know, because he wasn't acting or because things weren't going the way I thought they should or hoped they would, that you know, that he's not seeing this, you know, and why don't you do something about this? And, you know, and, and I just have to say to myself uh, what, what I just said to you uh, uh, as well. Who do we think we are that we can dictate where God is and, and when and how she, he, 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 should, he should act or what he should do? He's there. He's everywhere we go. I, I like the way David illustrated it. And I brought to, uh, my little Bible to read the scripture for today's message because I kind of like you know, I mean, I grew up on the King James Version. I'm not, I'm not uh, dictating which version you should study from or like, but uh, 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 the study Bible that I picked up that I like so much of the, uh, the insight and input of Dr. Jeremiah, it's in a different version. And uh, I like in the King James Version where it says, if I, if I, if I, uh, if I, uh, Whither shall I go that I from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there, and if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You know, a lot of times and, and we and we often I, I don't personally myself, but well, I shouldn't say I don't or have never, but I don't make a habit of it. We often use too loosely re relating. We often too loosely relate uh, some difficulty that we're going through in life to hell. When I can tell you the greatest difficulties in this life is going to seem mighty heavenly compared to hell. And, and we often use that term a little bit too loosely. But you know, a lot of times, you know, adversity that we're going through in life, it can seem like you know, really, really bad deal, you know. And uh, I think David was trying to express here that no matter how bad it gets, you can't go anywhere to flee from God's presence. You might feel like he doesn't see uh, your pain and you might uh, feel like uh, he's oblivious to what's occurring in your life, but he's everywhere. He knows your thoughts before you thunk them. He knows uh, uh, where you're at and what you're doing. We can't flee from his presence. It's so easy for us to forget in difficult times. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, and I have to wrap this up, I've run out of time, and as much as I am trying hard to uh, speak and present God's word without a written script, so much 
So many times I wish I had it to lean on. Hopefully I brought to light things that were helpful to you today. I guess uh, the message that I want to bring to you today is simply this. No matter what you're going through, no matter how much it looks like God's not there and he's not in this, you know, he's there. He's everywhere. He loves, he cares. He knows your thoughts before you think them. I mean, how much more clearly could it be said than how David, David put it? He's everywhere. But yet, still, at times of adversity, we cry out, Lord, where are you at in all of this? And, and we lose our, our faith and, 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 you know, and, you know, and I just wanted to share an experience of my own. You've all heard it before. I shouldn't say you all. There are some of you here who did not hear it. But I want to share one of those times when I so questioned God's presence in my life. And I can tell you as strange as it might sound to you, I know full well, still to this day, even though it's been such a long time, I had to really blow the dust off of this. I know well the importance of these words if Pete Carnahan ever finishes this writing. God has some great and beautiful and wonderful things prepared for me to do after that. I spent a lot of time feeling negligent. But it's on his time, not Pete Carnahan's time. I'm still confident I will do that. But it's about an experience, the most dramatic experience in my life where I was ready to turn my back on God and say, where are you at? Where's this God that I always believed in? And I'll just share it as I wrote it. It's just a portion of writing that belongs in a much bigger writing that I just haven't completed somehow yet to this point in time. Lying in that bed of affliction, fighting a grueling battle with that wretched disease, cancer. Holding my hand, he looked in my eyes and spoke, Son, just as difficult as one is when I wrote the words. Your daddy's not going to die. The Lord showed me life. And so my confidence would grow strong, especially when he would rise from that bed of affliction as his cancer would enter a stage of remission. And how that confidence would increase during these times of remission as I watched my dad live and laugh and love each day, much like any normal person who had not battled this wretched disease, or even more so, because he was battling this horrible disease. Until once again, like a thief in the night, cancer would break again and enter into my dad's body, stealing from him what all men relish and none can function without our health. Robbed of his physical vibrance, soon again my dad would wind up back in the hospital, lying in bed little more than a thin shell of the robust man that he once was. Remarkably, in spite of that missing article of prized possession that is one's health. My dad's joyful spirit and his mysterious happiness, as well as his solid faith in our loving Heavenly Father, always remained firmly intact. Oh, how I wished that I could equal his spiritual exuberance. However, though I tried very hard not to show it in Dad's presence, each time that Dad's health would, would wane and turn poorly, so too would my spirit. And somehow, even though I tried to hide it from Dad, even though I tried to mask it, Dad would see through me like a glass and he would... He'd see my broken spirit. And it would always cause him as if in reprimand to reach for my hand. And he'd look into my eyes. And he'd speak those words that will forever ring in my ears forever. So long as I draw breath, son, 
your daddy's not going to die. The Lord showed me life. So the war waged on for many years. Some periods of that time the fighting was quiet as this new medicine or that new drug would attack dad's cancer, keeping it for a time in check. Sadly, however, some of the time the battle was extremely intense, during which times great suffering was endured. Gladly, though, during the good spell, Dad and I were able to condense nearly a lifetime of father-son living into a small frame of time until, alas, the final battle would be waged, that defining battle that would at last declare a victor. According to medical opinion at that time, my dad was losing the battle that he had so gallantly waged Cancer had taken over nearly his entire body and his vital organs were beginning to fail. The outlook was indeed grimmer than it ever had been before and my weary spirit paralleled that course. How could this possibly be, I questioned. In this bed before me lays a man seemingly near death, my very own dad, a man who I had grown to know as one of tremendous faith as well as one who possessed a spiritual relationship of extraordinary nature with our loving Heavenly Father. Could this man that I knew and loved so well, who had walked so close to the Lord, even hearing him speak on one occasion in a clear and audible voice, could this man have so badly misinterpreted the good Lord's will concerning his life? By his bedside I sat holding his hand and wondering, would Dad open his eyes closed in on consciousness from the drug morphine? Would he open them one more time to look into mine and offer those words of reassurance? Your daddy's not going to die. The Lord showed me life, watching him struggle for every breath, each one coming even slower than the last. I wondered, would Dad rise from this bed yet again, defying the physical of a mortal being greater this time than ever before. Hope was surely gone from me, being a man of faith, and even having witnessed God's miraculous power before, I feel ashamed to make such a confession. For quite some time, those of us who knew and loved Dad knew that his suffering had been too great and that it would surely be better if he would simply pass on. Watching a loved one suffer is difficult to endure. No one knew this better than my mother, who throughout the entire experience seldom left Dad's side during his darkest times. And so it was, this final night, very difficult to watch Dad's last labor for life. He had not opened his eyes for quite a length of time, and it was much longer even since he could last communicate. The nurses had told us, speak to him just the same because he could probably hear us. We all spoke to him some, but it's difficult to talk in life to someone who can't respond. Selfishly in those waning moments, it seemed to me that Dad and I were the only people to exist in the entire world. Not only was he my only dad, of course, but also I was his only son. And this creates a bond that only two in our position can understand. Watching my dad struggle for life, I found myself hardly able to believe someone could breathe so very little and still be living. My hope was completely exhausted, but I had heard those reassuring words. I had heard them spoken in bold confidence. He showed me life. I had heard those words so often in grim times that if my dad was going to pass on from this life, I would not believe it until I saw him draw his last breath. Seconds seemed like minutes now, and 20 to 30 of them would pass as I watched the clock before Dad would draw his next feeble breath. And suddenly, after all of that time of unconsciousness and barely breathing, suddenly after all of that time, and much to my great surprise, after so long a period of unconsciousness, my dad opened his eyes and he looked into mine while at the same time making a faint attempt to sit up. And then just as suddenly, 
He closed his eyes and he fell into eternal peaceful rest. No sound, not a word had crossed my dad's lips in those final moments, but I came to realize later that daddy's eyes had spoken those words for a final time louder than my ears had ever heard them before. He showed me life. Finally, Dad's war for life was over. The final grueling battle had been lost. Great and sad relief was felt by us all. Speaking for myself, of course, I was glad that his suffering was done, but I found it nearly impossible to imagine living in this world without my dad and stunned and brokenhearted as I drove home from the hospital that night. November. November 5th, 93, my brokenheartedness quickly turned to bitterness. He showed me life. Those words echoed in my mind, yet my dad was gone. Where is this life? I questioned. Where is this God that I had believed in so long and who had so clearly shown my dad life? Sleep, I thought, would be impossible as I turned to bed in tears that night. Contrarily, though, heartache, anger, bitterness, and a sense of loss greater than I had ever known soon transformed into deep slumber. Little did I know as I drifted to sleep that night that my loving Heavenly Father was about to bestow upon me an act of his marvelous love that mankind simply cannot equal. At the age of 30 years, I lay to sleep that night, and quite naturally I, had, I believed at that time that I had known life for some 30 years. Oh, how I was about to be enlightened as I would learn in a vision that I had not yet seen one single day alive. In my sleep that night, I journeyed to a place not of this world, to a place that makes all of the things in this world appear strangely dim and mystically unreal. In my sleep that night, after what I believed to be living for 30 years, my loving Heavenly Father would show me that life that my daddy had seen. For the first time ever that night, I would know true life. Because he showed me life. My dearly beloved in Christ, I don't know how well I've done. I'm, I'm good at stumbling over my tongue without a written script. But the point I wanted to bring to you, the message I want to leave with you all here today is, in your darkest times, it's easy, I've done it, we've all done it. Cry out, God, where are you at? He's everywhere. And we are never forsaken. And that's my message to you today from our wonderful Lord. And I thank you for your kind and loving attention. I'll close with prayer. Forgive my... I'm sorry, Homer, I'm a little late. He warned me not to be. So, kind Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to, to share with your people. I... I I don't take lightly this position. And I pray, Lord, with your help that I have been able to give us all things to experience here together this morning, Heavenly Father, that will lodge in our hearts, that we can go forth and demonstrate them in our lives. I just thank you, Lord, for this time. It's precious time, Lord. Whether I'm standing up here or sitting back there, I thank you for our time together, Lord, and ask that you go with us as we leave this place. Watch over and keep us, everyone. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.